I'm Will Sentence. I'm CEO of Codesmith, a 12-week software engineering and machine learning residency based in New York and Los Angeles. And today on Frontend Masters, we're going to be talking through some of the hardest parts of JavaScript, but particularly of the new ES6 and ES7 features. I was inspired to create this course because as JavaScript has evolved, the hard parts have evolved too. We now have a whole new set of features that if we understand intimately and intuitively will empower us as developers. And so in this program, JavaScript, the new hard parts, we're going to understand in great depth how asynchronicity is now handled in JavaScript through promises, how we may think about accessing our data, collections of data through iterators, how we can control flows of data through generators and bringing it all together with async await. Throughout, we will be diagramming on the whiteboard, we'll be talking through our code with great precision. It's gonna give us the clarity under the hood to understand these new concepts. So I'm thrilled to have you along and I look forward to seeing you in the course itself. So we have to introduce a whole new world of features of JavaScript. These are features that happen outside of our JavaScript engine itself. These are features of the web browser. JavaScript is a little feature of the broader web browser. The web browser is full of features. The DOM, that's the model of our web page that JavaScript can interact with to change stuff on the web page. It's a sort of representation of the stuff on our page that JavaScript can write code to interact with that changes our web page. That's a feature outside of JavaScript. Our console is another web browser feature that's a feature outside of JavaScript. Our local storage, our the little, that, that database thing in the browser, our ability to speak to the internet, the XHR ability, all of these are not JavaScript features. They're found on MDN as a list of web browser features known, albeit in JavaScript, as web browser APIs. The reason they're known as that in JavaScript is that we use labels for those features from within JavaScript to stimulate, to get started, a web browser feature. And any feature that's not in my own runtime, in my own engine, is something I interface with. So we call it an AP interface, API. So we interact outside of JavaScript. We've got to introduce those to have any chance of solving this three-way conundrum. The only chance we have of solving it is to introduce web browser features, or in Node, they're known as background threads, All right, or APIs in Node as well. A language whose rules, or its rule about what data is available to you, is about where the function was born, where it's defined, is known as a lexically scoped language. That means a language that says, where you defined me is what determines, a positioning of my definition inside another function is what it determines what data I have available to me when I'm eventually run, eventually called, wherever you end up calling me. Because I attach the data from around me when I was born to me. And that's the first place I look besides the function execution context itself. That is known as a lexically scoped language, as opposed to a dynamically, like a it's called a statically scoped language, lexically or statically. St uh, statically or lexically scoped language. You could very easily imagine a language where the next place I'd look is global, not JavaScript. It is a statically or, di or lexically scoped language. So we can call this uh, backpack of data, want to be really fancy, we can call it a persistent lexical scope. This is our lexical scope bond or reference. Persistent, lex persistent lexical scope referenced data. Very catchy. Persistent <laughs> lexical scope referenced data. It's, it's very literal. <laughs> Go and say that in your senior engineering interviews. <laughs> They'll be very happy with you. You may also remember that the memory is called the variable environment. That means the, the variables are available to you around. So you can call it also the variable environment has been clo enclosed, closed over, and returned out of the function. So you might call it the closed over variable environment, the cove. Also not catchy. People intuitively call it the backpack. 
People also, unfortunately, I think unintuitively, but colloquially, typically call it, that's the best name, typically call it <laughs> the closure. You'll hear engineers say, put those values in the closure. Why I don't love that name is because, firstly, it doesn't make sense, but secondly, we call the whole concept closure. The idea of functions persisting their lexical scope references, their surrounding data from when they were born. We call the whole concept closure, and we call the backpack the closure. So I think that's just a, a bit too much under one label, and certainly a label doesn't mean that much to me anyway. So I like the name backpack, but people tend to call this backpack of data the closure. It is to say that we get to have, our functions get to have memories. Not their local memory that gets deleted each time, but a persistent cache of data attached to their very damn definition. Meaning we can have a function that when called, doesn't find data inside itself and looks in its persistent cache attached to it, all bundled up on a single function. It's a pretty beautiful design. Return next element, a special object with a next property on it, a method that when that is called, runs, starts, or continues the calling of create flow, which is where it was born. It was born by create flow, and so it has this ability to go and execute that function and then continue executing it by holding on to the memory in that function execution context and the position in that function execution context and then returning to that. Uh, it hits yield, returns out the value being yielded, pauses or sort of exits the execution context, just holds on to it here. Uh, we end up with a stream flow of values that we get one by one by returning, by running return next element dot next. We get a next element, the next element, but look how dynamically we control what they are. Every time you say yield keyword, the next thing is an expression that's going to evaluate to our next returned, or our, yeah, our next element in the flow of elements coming out of our, our flow. And those flows, you know, those functions that give us the next element from the flow are known as iterators. Okay, there we go. All right, anything that gives us a flow, element by element, is technically known as an iterator. But I prefer to think of it as being a flow of elements that we just grab one by one by running a function, switching on the tap, getting the next element, switching on the tap, next element. But here, we're producing that flow by running through a function, hitting a yield statement, giving that as the next element of the flow. Continue, yield statement, next element of the flow. Go back in, continue, yield statement, next element of the flow. We're now running functionality to give, to generate our next element of our flow. That also means we get to control the return manually ourselves into a function execution context. What method, Ben, do we call to initiate us going back into the execution context? Dot next. Dot next. We now have manual control of how to return back into a function execution context for the first time ever. All we needed to add, by the way, was the ability to track the position we were in. And probably some other stuff under the hood to do that. But that's essentially all we're adding. We're very used to persisting state from a prior execution context as a backpack of data. Now we also persist the position at which we exited the function execution context to allow us to head back in. But that's super powerful. We're now getting to suspend a function being run and then return to continue running its body of code by calling the next method that takes us back in. We manually control when we return back to run code. So what if we could use that to handle asynchronicity? We could initiate a task that takes a long time, for example, requesting data from a server, set it up, use the yield keyword to have that as be the, the, the return promise object, be stored out here in some way and throw us out of the execution context, then, continue throughout the execution context, continue running through our code, including attaching some functionality to be auto-triggered when that promise gets its value back. And what if that triggered functionality inside of it contained a call to next that took us back in to continue running our code with its value being passed back in, the value from the returned request, the response object that came back from into the promise value. Wow. And that is exactly what we're going to do here. We can use the ability to, uh, to pause create flows running and then restart it only when our data returns. 
we get to control when we return back to create flow and continue executing by setting up the trigger to do so, which is the next method, to be run by our function that was triggered by the promises resolution when the value returned from Twitter. It's a little bit of a sort of loopy back and forwards. It's all going to be auto, uh, autom automated by async await. We're going to build async await from scratch using this generator function concept. And then we're going to try, uh, sort of tidy it up, wrap it up using async await, which is going to automate a few of the pieces. But this is our final code. These last two sides are our final code. <laughs>